Hi, and welcome to the STAR Alternate to Decision Making video. I'm Lorna Salgado from Region 10. Before we can start talking about making decisions for STAR Alternate 2, we have to back up and talk about ESSA, the Every Student Succeeds Act, which is one of the things that has guided some of the changes to our eligibility requirements for STAR Alternate 2. They've clarified the scope of students who are taking STAR Alternate 2, and you'll notice in here it talks about ESSA imposed a cap to limit only 1% of total numbers, number of students who are assessed in a state with an alternate assessment. That does not mean that you're limited to 1% at your campus or in your district. You make the decision based on the student needs. The only time we're trying to make a 1% cap is at the state level, statewide. That's their goal, to make a 1% cap. You do not have to do that at the state or, dis or excuse me, at the district or campus level, but we need to be making good decisions. So, um, last year we had to request a waiver because we were over 1%, and this year we will be requesting it again, and unfortunately our numbers of students taking the test didn't go down. They actually went just ever so slightly up so one of the things that the state has wanted to do is to make sure that we've given districts um, the correct information about who the appropriate students are to take STAR Alternate 2. And I hope that this video will give you a little bit of support and guidance as you make those decisions throughout the school year. This is the new form. It actually became available last spring, late spring. Um, the questions didn't change. What did change is how they helped us to understand the meaning behind the questions, and they really clarified a lot. I do want to say that our first consideration as an ARD committee is always the general STAR test, with or without designated supports, or what we typically call accommodations. That should always be the first thing we think of. We look at that and see, can we do that test with these things? If not, then we begin to look at the STAR Alternate 2 participation requirements to see if the student does indeed meet that. So the first thing you're gonna do is look at the eligibility criteria. And it is actually at the very top of the page. And it says that STAR Alternate 2 is a statewide assessment for students with the most significant cognitive disability. Um, I wanted to talk about the word cognitive because a lot of times we think of it as a student is really low academically, so they must meet STAR Alt 2 criteria. I mean, they're low in reading, they're low in math, they're struggling in writing. So if they're significantly below grade level, multiple years, say they're a fifth grader reading on that first grade level, we assume, oh, well, they must be eligible for STAR Alt 2. And that's not the case because we're not looking at just academic skills. That's only one of the five criteria. The big thing that you have to look at is, does the student have a cognitive disability? That means in their thinking, planning, comprehension. When we look at this, you're gonna see the five questions come up next, and we're gonna talk about them. All five have to be answered yes in order for the student to be eligible for STAR Alternate 2. So this is the thing that talks about a significant cognitive disability. It talks about using the FIE, the full and individual evaluation, and then at the bottom, it talks about the deficit, if the student has deficits in the ability to plan, comprehend, reason, and then also in adaptive behavior. Now, this does not mean that the student has to be coded with an intellectual disability. It also doesn't mean that those assessments have to be formal. They may be. We may have done formal intellectual and formal adaptive behavior um, scales for a student, but if not, for example, if the student has an other health impairment, maybe autism, and we didn't do them for some reason or couldn't complete them, um, there should be some type of information on the FIE telling us that, hey, even though it wasn't a formal evaluation, this is what we know about the student's ability to plan, comprehend, and reason. And so even if the student isn't coded with an intellectual disability, we still should have addressed those areas on the FIE. So the one I wanted to highlight on our question one considerations is the part about because it's a significant cognitive disability, it really isn't for students with learning disabilities or speech impairment only. 
um, that's not really who it was designed for because those students typically um, have the intellectual potential to reach grade level expectations, even though they're far behind. And so it's unlikely that they would be assessed with STAR. And, and usually people question that a little bit, but I want you to think about the, a learning disability by nature says average cognition. It means that a student just has a processing deficit. So as we have that average cognition with a pattern of strengths and weaknesses, that's not the most significant cognitive deficit. So that doesn't really meet the definition. Question two, does the student require specialized extensive supports to access grade level curriculum and environment? So a lot of people are real quick to go, oh yeah, they need extensive supports in grade level curriculum, but notice it also has the word environment. And so this is the, the wording that we have on it, that a student with a significant cognitive disability would have extensive, repeated specialized supports and materials that are beyond typical peers. In fact, maybe even be, well, definitely beyond what typical peers with a disability would even have. Um, they will use substantially modified materials and they will learn in alternate ways. And notice at the bottom, it talks about, this is not just the school environment, but their difficulties in adaptive behavior are gonna cross life domains. It's not something that's just gonna show up at school like an academic deficit might be. So this is the part where they've given us some considerations and clarifications. Um, so they give us on that third bullet some great ideas of what a specialized extensive supports look like at school. Voice output, one-to-one -one instruction, assistance with feeding or other daily needs, uh, physical mobility that would otherwise result in health or safety concerns. Um, and then the behavior issues, the regular and frequent reinforcement system, and or if students struggle with social situations, such as our students with autism spectrum disorders. Question three is, does the student require intensive individualized instruction in all instructional settings? So notice it wouldn't just be, you know, they're okay in math, but reading's really, really bad. That wouldn't be a cognitive disability. So they would require individualized instruction. It's not temporary, it's not for a certain content. Um, and when we work with students, it's gonna require alternate or non-traditional methods for the student to show what they've learned, to maintain what they've learned. And so here's some of the considerations for that. Um, there's probably gonna be IEP goals that are both functional and academic. And this type of student will appear very different instructionally than that of their age appropriate peers and, and their peers that have disabilities that aren't as significant. Um, individualized instruction in every academic area that's not temporary or skill and content specific. Um, it talks about that they require an actual alternate curriculum, which is bigger than just modified curriculum. They get frequent prompting that differs from their age appropriate peers. Question four, do they participate in grade level TEKS through prerequisite skills? And then I like that they kind of added, for instance, an elementary student might be three to four levels below, whereas a high school student may be seven to nine levels below. And then it gives us some things to think about. Um, these are probably students that need hands-on. They need demonstrations along with ver uh, verbal directions. They need things broken into steps. They need prompting. They need multiple opportunities and repeated practice beyond what would be typical for them to learn a skill. Um, and again, it gives you three or more grade levels for elementary and seven to nine. And it also says that the IEP goals and the PLATH should indicate this performance. We shouldn't have a PLATH that shows grade level or close to grade level or slightly modified things if this is the student that we're talking about. And the last question, is it based on the student's significant cognitive disability and not other factors? Um, and let's talk, look at those on the next page. Um, based on achievement and not because the student was out of school for medical treatment or illness, in that case, the student might qualify for a medical exception, but we always wanna consider that we don't, they might be out of school and that might be part of their disability, but we don't think that is why they're not learning. Um, and then I like that they clarified this about extended period of severe behavior that results in an inability to test. Um, then you can call TEA to determine whether a score code of zero other is appropriate. So 
if there's something really big behaviorally um, where you don't even think the student can test, you can call TEA about that. Part two is to discuss the assurances, and I'm not going to go over them here, but you can see them. Um, and it really means to actually talk about them. It must be initialized by district personnel, and it doesn't matter who that district personnel is. It can be special education, it can be the administrator, it can be anybody uh, on the committee that wants to go over them. Uh, they must discuss it as a part of the ARD. That document becomes a part of the ARD. The last little part you'll complete talks about which grade the student is in, so it shows the test they'll be taking. And then for a student in high school, it gives you the PEAMS information. So the ARD committee should indicate the subjects they'll be taking. Um, they have to be tested in the same school year that they're enrolled in the course, and that makes a lot of sense and becomes very simple when that's a third grader. But sometimes in high school, it comes down to, well, all of our ninth graders take biology, but for some reason, maybe this was the only ninth grader, so we're gonna do something else for science this year and come back to biology next year. They're going to take the test when they take the course. So whenever they're enrolled in that course, that's when they'll take that test. And we do have some campuses like IB types of campuses where every eighth grader, for example, takes algebra one. Well, if you are a student with a significant cognitive deficit, you would never have an above grade level test. So if you're star alternate two, you should be receiving instruction based on prerequisite skills and not any above grade skills. So there's no, even though everyone else might take that in the eighth grade, you would still take eighth grade star alternate two. So I hope that's helped you with your decision making for star alternate two. I will actually go back to the beginning and show you my email address so that if you need to contact me, you are certainly welcome to do so. So contact me if you need to, or if you're from another um, region in Texas, feel free to call your service center and get support from them as well. Thanks for attending.